The ability to speak and make words by shaping our breath into sounds is what distinguishes us from every other species and makes us human, for better and for worse. The ability to speak is also what distinguishes us, us as adults from children. And the command of that same ability is what transforms the poet from a person into a visionary and a seer. I stand before you of able tongue, a man and an artist. But I'm not just any man or any artist because I'm an African artist. Like so many white Africans, my ancestors were criminals leaving the Netherlands of Europe in search of a clean slate, a second chance to do good, an opportunity not to repeat the mistakes of history. My ancestors failed miserably as Dutch, twisted into Afrikaans, and the Boers used their voices to take possession of lands that did not belong to them in order to subjugate and silence their native hosts so that they could rape the rich earth for its gold, oil, silver, uranium, chrome, copper, coal, and platinum, and everything else until diamonds turned to blood. I bow my bloody white head in shame, heavy with the burden of history, laden with the horror that was the anvil upon which white privilege hammered out its deaf dictatorship for centuries. But that does not make me less of an African, and I'm not my ancestors. The right to speak is not the same as the ability to speak. In the spring of 1968, Thousands of black men took this to the streets of Memphis with protest posters that declared, I am a man. They were protesting against the racist habit of being called a boy, demanding the right to speak for themselves and be recognized as men. This right to speak, to decide for yourself, declaring your independence by expressing in your own words who you are and what you believe in is the most fundamental of all human rights. The mechanics of slavery colonialism, apartheid, and present-day neo-colonialism has been that tyranny of silence through which Africans and people of color are spoken for and on behalf of. No matter how well-intended, the paternalism of deciding who might speak and what they might say is pejorative as any slur. Reducing men to boys and treating ancient cultures as if they were illiterate and in need of saving are not the foundations of equality, much less respect. Africa does not need to be saved from anything except prejudice and generalization. The darkest era of colonial in history and the most cynical of political expedients took place in Berlin in 1884, when 13 European nations and the United States drew lines across the African continent, drawing borders between themselves, each taking their claims to resources and economies under the guise of geopolitical paternalism. Not one single African kingdom, nation, or state was present to defend their rights or heritage much less the mineral rights of their land. Not one African voice was heard as Berlin, in Berlin as pens mark territory like a surgeon, surgeon's blade cuts through skin and into flesh of a living being not even anesthetized. Just over a decade later, the British invaded the kingdom of Benin, present-day Nigeria, with the stated intention to loot and steal the kingdom's royal treasures, ivory, bronzes, and ancient cultural artifacts which now hang like ideological trophies in the British Museum, the Metropolitan Museum, in public and private collections around the world. The demand to return these objects to their rightful nation are not about repatriation of objects, but about cultural heritage and subsequent unity that these powerful and ancient symbols might embody in securing the identity and stability of a nation. The ivory masks of Queen Ioba that date from the 16th century are the equivalent of the crown jewels in the coronation of kings. So the equivocation that they are world heritage and therefore belong in the British and Metropolitan Museums is to deny an African nation the right to decide for themselves what their contribution to world heritage might be. How dare any museum bursting with the trophies of colonial greed take the liberty to speak on behalf of the nations they decimated with extreme violence. At the very least, they should pay rent on, and use the money to build future museums that can replace the royal palaces that were destroyed by colonial exigence. In the words of Joseph Conrad in the book Heart of Darkness, they were conquerors, and for that, you only want brute force. Nothing to boast of when you have it, since your strength is just an accident arising from the weakness of others. They grabbed what they could for the sake of what was to be got. It was robbery with violence, aggravated murder on a great scale, and men going at it blind, as is proper for those who tackle the darkness. I'm not here to give you a history lesson so much as to suggest a change in direction of the ways we address the 
questions of history, whose story, and in particular, what we might call African art. The walls of incarnations of the exhibition have been left empty, save for wallpaper, mirrors, and a few works of video. The wallpaper is composed of the word believe, broken up into three lines, so that the word lie teases and taunts your peripheral vision and faith. The walls have been deliberately left empty in order that you might consider how these walls came to be built. The Center for Fine Arts that hosts the Incarnations exhibition was designed and built by Victor Horta between 1919 and 1928, at the height of the colonial era. The economic wealth from the colony flowed through the streets of Brussels and, directly or indirectly, found symbolic embodiment in the Palace of Fine Arts. It is impossible to look at the grandeur, elegance, ambition, and proportion of this building without considering the context by which Belgium could afford such a building. As you catch yourself looking at the mask, as you catch yourself looking in the mirror, consider how your gaze might be influenced by the habits of your learning, what you believe in, and consider looking back at yourself from the other side of the mask. The undeniable fact remains that Africa was never discovered because unlike the New World, it was always there, always present, just on the other side of the Mediterranean, and more ancient than the Old World. Already in the 16th century, the Berber cartographer Leo Africanus presented a relatively accurate map of the continent orientated towards the south, and you will see it on the exhibition over there. This orientation is significant in guiding our tongues to speak with respect and appropriate dialect. The southern projection was not a mistake, so much as a witness to the human condition by which manner habit took the form of enlarging Europe and the northern hemisphere and placing it on top in the center of the globe. This habit not only embodied Eurocentric prejudice, fully dressed in the masquerade of the naked emperor we call common sense, but it also denied the natural pull of gravity, which might suggest that magnetic north be placed at the bottom of the map as things would fall if you dropped them. Consider now looking at your world from a different point of view, from an African perspective. Turn your habits inside doubt and your perceptions upside down. I stand before you as an artist. I am a contradiction and a conundrum and cannot speak for a continent any more than I can ex expect anybody to speak on my behalf. I speak for myself with my roots as a freedom fighter on the front lines of the anti-apartheid movement, as an artist with an identity that has been seeded in the raw experiences of life. Like so many fellow African artists, our art has been forged on the struggle to speak and be heard. The most basic right might fall upon deaf ears to many Europeans who have forgotten that their freedom to speak with equality, fraternity, and liberty was written with quills soaked in the bloodstains of revolution. In 1948, the same year apartheid was legislated, Jean-Paul Sartre wrote the introduction to Black Orpheus, the collection of poems edited by Leopold Senghor that launched the Negritude movement. Sartre asked, what would you expect to find when the muzzle that has silenced the voices of black men is removed? Would you expect they would thunder your praise? After centuries of slavery, colonialism, post neo-colonialism, the African continent is now finding back its voice, but it's not what you might like to imagine. It was not long ago that civil disobedience in the colonies was met with the punishment of severing limbs, and African tongues were ripped out with enforced practice of European laws, orders, traditions, values, ethics, philosophies, channeled through tongues and languages that were Eurocentric, but words can be brokered, and histories that were written in blood can be rewritten, and the habit of prejudice can be unlearned. Incarnations is an exhibition curated by an African artist in dialogue with an African collector and patron from an Afrocentric point of view. It is not encyclopedic. It is not representative of a continent, for we dare not make that mistake too often made of claiming to speak for 54 countries, more than 2,000 living languages, countless different nations and identities, intertwined cultural histories, spread out through time all the way back to the origin of the species. The exhibition begins as a friendship between Syndica and myself, an artist and a collector, a spiritual experience of art rooted in community. Many of the artists on the exhibition and in the collection are also friends because we have found our common humanity 
and community through a faith in art. The collection is a role model for other Africans and Afrocentric collectors to follow because it is rooted not only in the history of classic African art, but it respects the traditions that grow, change, evolve, and shift. And I would like to quote an Igbo proverb that Chinua Achebe was so fond of. The world is a dancing masquerade. If you want to understand it, you cannot remain standing in one place. Identity is not simple. Identity is not a simple understanding or checklist for an African artist or a person of color. But a skin that's been peeled and ripped and flayed and scratched off from vital flesh so many times that the wounds might never heal. Our cultural heritage is imprisoned behind glass in museums around the world, and our history is told from the point of view of the colonizers who never bothered to listen to the voices they refused to hear. Why do Europeans insist on dividing classic from contemporary African art with titles like traditional, art premier, tribal, or was the case of the second exhibition of the Beaux-Arts in 1930, Art Negre? Why do Europeans consider Picasso, Matisse, Braque, Leger, Modigliani, etc., etc., to be the heirs and custodians of a language of abstraction that they learned from a cotta, fang, leg, a mask, or figure. The contemporary European experience is articulated and expressed through its luxury. The revolutionary foundations that this luxury was built upon have long been forgotten, and democracies grew old and rusted to the point that voting has become an inconvenience more than a consequence. It makes sense from this point of view that European eyes might sing the praises of the lines, shapes, forms, patinas, and European provenance of classic African works of art, reducing their spirits to aesthetic form by which the so-called connoisseur might then ask, what does classic African art have in common with contemporary? From the other side of the map, from the other side of the mask, the first-hand experience in which identity is still a struggle and the right to speak has not yet translated into the right to be heard. African art is both rural and urban, continental and diasporic, digital and masquerade, create arts from the spirits calling to be heard. These spirits might be as real as the demons embodied in Nkisi or the political protests of the Black Panther movement. Representation is not an economic privilege for an African artist because representation is the witness to a struggle embodying spirits more powerful than experience. Because it was one of the few European artists who understood this when he explained to Andre Malraux that African art is an exorcism and that it gave him the keys to the understanding with which he was able to unlock his perceptions in order to paint Les Damoiselles d'Avignon. Please do not ask me to justify why I am an African, nor ask me what makes African art different, and I will repay you with the same courtesy to not ask you to justify the prejudice implicit in your question. Let me simply say that what makes African art special is that when you look at an African work of art, it looks right back at you because it is alive. African art is a witness to the time and place, regardless of where the artist chooses to live, the color of his or her skin, or the nature of their faith. In closing, I would like to read a few lines from a poem written in 1919, the same year that Horta began the construction of the building. The poem is called The Second Coming by the Irish poet William Butler Yeats, and it is appropriate not only because Yeats believed he was in spiritual contact with Leo Africanus, the author of the map over there, but also because it inspired and gave birth to the post-colonial novel Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed blood tide is loose and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction and the worst are full of passionate intensity. Indeed, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. And in the words of Maria McKeba, Mama Africa, Aluta Continua. <laughs>